thank you for the introduction. Sorry about the delay. <coughs> so I'll be talking about uh, non-interactive multi-party computation. And this is joint work with Shai Levy, Yuval Shai, Abhishek Jain, Amin Sahai, and Elon Yugev from all parties places in the world. Okay, so I'll be talking about multi-party computation. Uh, we all know what it is, but I will say it in one slide. So in multi-party computation, there is a set of uh, pairs that don't trust each other, and they want to compute some function on their inputs. So each layer has some input that he wants to keep private, and uh, still he wants to be able to compute some function on all the inputs while preserving uh, privacy and, of course, making sure that the computation is correct. So this is a multi-party computation. In this talk, I'll be interested uh, mostly about malicious security, meaning that the parties can be malicious, <coughs> send any message they want, at any point in time, uh, without any restrictions, without even following the protocol. Uh, there's, of course, as you know, there's lots of solutions, uh, starting from information theoretic solutions that do not require any computational assumptions, and all the way to computational solutions based on uh, lots of uh, assumptions, cryptographic assumptions, and uh, some of the solutions require correlated uh, setup or some trusted form of setup, or uh, some solutions do not require any sort of setup. And the more assumptions we have, basically, we get a better protocol. And it can be in terms of the, the corruptions that we can tolerate, or it can be in the number of rounds the protocol lasts, or it can be in the amount of bits that each player sends, and so on and so forth. So the more assumptions we have, the better protocol we get. Uh, in this talk, I'll be talking about a very restricted setting of multi-party computation that is called non-interactive multi-party computation. So this is a very, very limited uh, setting in which parties uh, are completely asynchronous. Each player wakes up at, at some point in time, sends a single message to an evaluator, and that's it, it goes back to sleep, without seeing any other message that any, any other player sends. So this is a very restricted setting of MPC, and it's not even clear that it's possible to do anything in this setting. Uh, this, uh, uh, this setting in which each player sends a single message to an evaluator is called, um, maybe the, the configuration of the players is called the star pattern. I'll be talking about other configurations in the end of the talk, towards the end. But this is the, maybe one primal example, which is, uh, I think, very interesting. Uh, we can talk about other configurations, uh, maybe most notably the chain, where each player sends a message to the next player in the chain. I'll be talking about it next. And one interesting property of this very limited setting is that, uh, is that each configuration of the players gives you a different possible notion of security that you can achieve. And we call this the best possible notion of security, which is what I'm going to describe next. So think of a scenario in which you have three parties uh, holding inputs x, y, and z, and they wish to compute some function on, on their inputs, some f of x, y, and z. And let's assume that party three is corrupted and it's colluding with the evaluator. So what can happen? So since uh, each player wakes up at any, at any point in time he wants and sends a single message, then basically the evaluator that colludes with the third party can compute any function of the form, any value of the form, f of x, y, and any value z that he wants. So it's a very strong attack that the adversary can do. Can do. And therefore, we cannot hope to get a very strong notion of security, like in the classical setting. Uh, and if you think about it for two minutes, you will see that if you are aiming for a simulation-based notion of security, uh, and you want to support any function, then this will be impossible. Why? Because this notion of uh, non-interactive multi-party computation implies a notion of obfuscation called virtual black box. And we know that this is impossible if you want to support any function. So we have to resort to an insmushability based notion of security, which says basically the following. If party three is corrupted and colluding with the evaluator, then for any x, y, which are the inputs of the first and second player, and x prime and y prime, which are a, a different set of inputs to the first player, if the residual function, namely f of x and y hardwired inside, and only z is a free variable, if the residual function is uh, equivalent 
for x and y and x prime and y prime, then the adversary that colludes with the third party should not distinguish whether the input of the first and second players was x and y or x prime and y prime. So this is a standard indistinguishability notion of security. And this is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, the notion of a residual function has been studied for uh, maybe six or seven years. It was introduced in the work of uh, Halevi, Linda, and Pinkas. Uh, and it has been very widely used since in the literature about functional encryption and distinguishability of obfuscation. So this is the notion of security we're going to aim for. Uh, good. Uh, it's, it's known uh, because, similarly to the equivalence uh, of a simulation-based security notion to VVP, it's not hard to see that an indistinguishability-based notion of security in this setting implies indistinguishability of obfuscation. So if we hope to support any function in this setting, we better assume indistinguishability of obfuscation. So this will be a necessary assumption. Now, we talked about the assumptions that we need in terms of hardness, Let's talk about the assumptions we need in terms of setup. What each party should, what we should assume about the setup of the system. So, a first observation, which is trivial, is that each player must authenticate its input. If a player doesn't authenticate its input, then the evaluator can pretend to be that party, because there's no way a party can generate an input if it's not authenticated, that the evaluator cannot. So, an evaluator can pretend to be uh, some input the sum player, generate any input he wants, and break the security of the scheme. Here's an example. Consider again the same setting. Three players, x, y, and z, and only player three is colluding with the adversary. If the second party doesn't uh, authenticate its input, then the evaluator can uh, generate a message that looks like a message that the second player sent. Let's say this message is called y star. And if by chance y star splits the value of f where x is hardwired inside, then he can distinguish x from x prime. So this means that each player has to authenticate its input, which means in some sense we, have, we must have uh, some public infrastructure. So setup is necessary in our setting, at least uh, public infrastructure. Uh, previous solutions for this problem of non-interactive MPC, they required much more a uh, set of assumptions than just a PKI. And let me review what's going on in the, in the previous works. So this, the setting of non-interactive uh, MPC was introduced by uh, Fagi Kilian Noor uh, a lot of time ago. And uh, their set of assumption was actually pretty, pretty good. So they didn't assume almost no setup except a shared private string between all players, which is uh, secret to the, to the evaluator, which we can implement using a PKI in some sense. But their solution is completely non-collusion resistant. So even if, if, if even a single player colludes with the evaluator, then there is no security in their scheme. And more modern works uh, that rely on I.O., which is necessary if we want to get collusion resistance, uh, they have a, a strong set of assumptions. They all rely on something called correlated private randomness. And what this means in a very simple language is that there is an additional trusted party, which is not part of the game, that before the protocol begins, somehow generates an obfuscation of some circuit and publishes it so everybody can see it. And so this is a very strong set, uh, assumption on the setup, because who is this trusted party that is going to obfuscate some circuit? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, their schemes are very secure in terms of uh, collusion resistance. They're fully collusion resistant. They're the best you can hope for. So this raises the question, can we get full collusion resistance while assuming the minimal set of assumption uh, we can? And this is our result. We almost uh, completely answered this question. We show a protocol which is fully collusion resistant. So any, any amount of players can collude with the adversary. Uh, the setup that we need is a PKI, which I said is necessary. And we also have a CRS, common, common random stream, not reference stream. And the hardness assumption that we require are IO, which as I said is necessary. And uh, we also need the DDH, a decision on the FIAMA, both with some exponential security. And uh, the first uh, comment I'd like to make on the result is that the PKI we have is reusable, so we can 
we use it over multiple sessions of the protocol, so you can do it again. You can send more and more messages with the same PKI. You don't need to resample the PKI. And uh, of course, getting rid of the DTH assumption is an open question, which I think is very interesting. Uh, we have several extensions and implications of this result. Uh, the first one is a notion that we call multi-party obfuscation. Uh, it's a variant of multi-party computation, but now the inputs of the players are modules of code and not inputs for a function. So each player can, in this notion, each player can take its code or some module that it wrote at home, obfuscate it in some way, send it into to the evaluator that can take all the modules and compile them into one big program without revealing any information about the underlying module. So this is what we call multi-party obfuscation. And uh, another extension that we have uh, is that I said that I mentioned the result for the star pattern in which players send a single message to an evaluator, but our techniques generalizes to any interaction pattern. So you define any graph that you want in which parties communicate in the, according to the edges of the graph, and eventually somehow the output should get to the uh, evaluator. Uh, we can support anything with the same assumption, and we get in any setting the best possible security for that interaction pattern. I'll talk about it a little bit in the end. Uh, okay, so this is the, uh, the result. Let me talk about the techniques for a couple of minutes. So we use, we heavily use a notion called multi-key FHG. In multi-key FHG, here's what it gives us, what it advises us. We can sample a sequence of n encryption keys and decryption keys. So ek1 until ekn, and dk1 to dkn. So we can sample a sequence of n encryption and decryption keys. We can encrypt the message according to each encryption key. So we can encrypt x1 according to ek1, x2 according to ek2, until xn according to encryption, the last encryption key, and get a, a sequence of n ciphertexts. Using these n ciphertexts, we can take take we can take the n ciphertext and move them or re-randomize them into a ciphertext of the same message, but under a common key. And the common key is just you can think about it as the concatenation of all the, the, the encryption keys. So this is just a re-randomization uh, procedure that takes a ciphertext under one specific key and translates it into a ciphertext under uh, the concatenation of all the encryption. Then, once we have all the ciphertext under the same key, we can do any homomorphic operation that we want. So we can take the sequence of ciphertext and do some homomorphic uh, operation on them and get the ciphertext of the homomorphic value of the, of the evaluation of under the underlying values. And then we can do another operation which is called partial decryption. So what this operation gives us is that each player, using only its decryption key, can in some sense peel one layer of the encryption and get a ciphertext uh, which is and get some sort of a partial decryption which is under without his uh, key in some sense. So each player can take the ciphertext which is under the concatenation of all the keys and peel one layer of, uh, of, uh, the, of the key. Then using partial decryptions, the sequence of all partial decryptions, there is a completely public operation that's called final decryption that takes the partial decryptions and gives you the value. So this is completely public. You don't need any secret key for that. So this is what uh, multi-key FHG allows us to do. Uh, there are many properties uh, that it satisfies. One of them is that the size of a ciphertext <coughs> of an evaluated ciphertext should be independent of the size of the function that we evaluated, or at least depend only on its depth and not on its size. That's uh, like in any FHG. Uh, the security that we have here is, in addition to just semantic security in, uh, of encryption, we also have a security notion that tells us that there should be a simulator that can generate partial decryptions without knowing the secret key of some specific player. So there is a simulator that doesn't know the key of the ith player, knows the output of the computation, and can generate a simulated partial decryption for the ith coordinate. So this is what uh, the security of this uh, notion gives us. And there are many instantiations, uh, starting from uh, the, 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 more, the, the original ones who were based on LWE, and there's a newer instantiation of Dolly based on IO and DDH. 
they offer various different trade-offs between exactly exactly what's going on. I'm not going into that. I will just say that we are using the scheme that is based on I/O and DDH, and just because it's more compatible with our assumptions. But we could use also the schemes based on LWU. Okay. So this is multi-key FHE. Now that we have uh, this primitive in hand, let's see how the scheme works. So let's start with the honest case where there's no collusion. It's much easier. So party I will just sample an encryption key and decryption key for the multi-key FHE scheme. This is pretty straightforward. And the message that party I will send is just an encryption of its, of its private input under uh, the encryption key and an obfuscation of a circuit. So this is where we use I.O. The circuit, what it does, is very simple. It just does what, whatever you expect it to do. It takes the ciphertext as input. It expands it into the expanded ciphertext. It does the homomorphic evaluation, and eventually it does the partial decryption. It has hardwired the decryption key for the partial decryption. So that's what you expect. No surprises here. Uh, there's, there are many issues with this uh, idea. First of all, the expand operation is randomized, so we need to somehow support randomization. Uh, that's easy, because we, that's easy given the, the literature on I.O. We just use a PRF. We just use a PRF to sample the randomness and hope that I.O. will guarantee security. So that's an easy issue that we take care of. The second, which is slightly more uh, problematic, is the authentication. I told you that each player should authenticate its input, and I didn't authenticate my input here. So we had a signature scheme. So the, the, the key of a party will not be only an encryption key and decryption key of a multi-key FHE scheme, but will, it will also be a, sig a, 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 a signature key and a verification key of a signature scheme. Uh, the circuit will verify the signature, of course. So that's the whole honest scheme. Using a, a, a signature scheme is not trivial with I.O. It, 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 it introduces lots of problems. Uh, so we designed like a special signature scheme that allows us to make the proof go through. Uh, I don't think it's uh, well, very, very interesting for this talk, but you can see the details in here. How does the proof work? So the, the high-level idea is to eliminate the decryption key from the obfuscation, right? That's, that's the only secret thing in the obfuscation that I described. So we're going to do a sequence, a very long sequence of hybrids in which we use the simulation of the simulator of the multi-key FHE scheme, go input by input the, the circuit, and eventually get into a circuit in which we don't have the decryption key of the IF player, but only use the simulation the simulator uh, to sample an indistinguishable value. So that's the idea. Each step of, uh, the, in this hybrid uh, proof uses the security of the functional PRF, the I.O., uh, the multi-key FHE simulator, and some other things. That's how the proof looks like. It's uh, very similar to, uh, to a proof uh, that uh, Anant et al. had in the context of combiners of obfuscation. It's very similar. OK, let's go to the malicious case which is uh, the main focus of this work. So what happens if uh, the adversary is malicious? The first problem that you run into, which is basically the, same, the only problem that there is, what happens if an adversary sends a ciphertext which is completely messed up, like a malformed ciphertext? What does partial decryption give us if the ciphertext is malformed? What will the simulator guarantee if the ciphertext is malformed? It's really not clear. So what we do is we add zero knowledge proof. That's what you expect to do. So each player will send, in addition to the obfuscation of the circuit, will also uh, send a zero knowledge proof that proves that the ciphertext is a legal ciphertext. But again, using a zero knowledge proof in the context of I/O is not always easy. What, so you and the technique that we know is to use something called a simulation sound, a statistically simulation sound, non-interactive zero knowledge proof. That's the standard uh, technique in the I/O literature. But this is still not enough for us. And the reason is that the adversary can plug in in the, in the coordinates that he controls. He can plug in any value he wants. And if he plugs in any value he wants, we cannot use the simulation of the multi-key FHG because we need to know the output of the computation for the simulator. So how would we know the output of the computation? So for that, we construct something we call a statistical simulation extractable non-interactive zero knowledge which allows us, uh, in the proof, uh, to extract the secret key of the parties, the, of the malicious parties, and get, their, uh, and get their decryption key. And get their decryption key, decrypt, decrypt the value, and compute the value of, 
and know the value of the computation in the proof. So this is the technical uh, challenges we had. So we construct this special uh, zero knowledge proof, and this is what it allows us to do. Okay. So this is how the final circuit looks like in the malicious setting. So we get now not only a ciphertext, we get also a proof and a signature. The circuit first verifies the signature, then verifies the proof, and then does exactly what it did before. It expands the ciphertext, does the homomorphic evaluation, and outputs the partial decryption. So this is the scheme. Uh, let's talk about, uh, for a couple of minutes, about other interaction patterns. Uh, the same idea generalizes, generalizes to any interaction pattern. Maybe the most interesting one, or the most natural one, is the chain pattern. So think of n players sitting on the chain. Player i sends a message only to player i plus 1. And eventually, the nth player sends a message to the evaluator. This is the interaction pattern that we allow. And the, the natural question is whether we can support such an, such an interaction pattern, whether we can do multi-party computation uh, restricted to this interaction pattern. And our result generalizes immediately to this setting. Uh, the only difference is now the circuit, instead of getting all the ciphertext, will get only the ones from the future. And we will hardwire into the circuit the ones from the past. From before, you mean the chain. So that's the same, that's the idea. Um, the con conclusion of the work is a construction of a collusion resistant, non interactive multi party computation protocol. The setup assumption is a PKI and a CRS. The computational assumptions, the hardest assumptions, are IO and the decision on the element with substantial security. And two natural, very natural open questions is to get rid of the DH assumption. And I think uh, it's very interesting to devise protocols for specific functions without such strong assumptions. So that should be a very interesting question. Thank you. research the second point for specific functionalities. So um, do you have some specific example for this? Yeah, so uh, I think it's not hard to see, if you think about it for a couple of minutes, that you can do like a protocol for, let's say, computing the sum of the, of the inputs of the players, almost without assumption. Like you need a very mild assumption. You don't need I.O. kits. Can you do something more than computing maybe the sum and the product? Can you compute? I don't know, a very simple circuit, like that two circuit, and not that one circuit. Simpler functions. Okay. Have any other questions? Yeah, yeah, so let's answer speak again. 